Okay, so I gave you a bit of a head start and I literally just differentiated it on the spot. So this is my first derivative with respect to time. Here's my second derivative. Now at this line right here, I have the second derivative, but it's still in terms of time. Do you notice that? Let me just highlight that for you. There it is, there's the t. So this is still as a function of time. But I can restate this in terms of the displacement by noticing that what I have here inside my square brackets, I've just put it in square brackets for the specific purpose of sort of highlighting it, is it's not quite x, is it? It's not quite x. It's actually x, yeah, minus b. Once you subtract that from both sides, that's what you have, right? So I've got this x minus b. Now, I wonder if this rings a bell. Again, talking back to um, exponential growth and decay. Do you remember that exponential growth and decay didn't always look like that? If you weren't going down to zero, right, or starting from zero, we talked about modified growth and decay, you got an ever so slightly different differential equation. Do you remember that? Um, things like, say, what was um, uh, Newton's law of cooling was a really uh, you know, important example that we looked at. We could say that you know, the change in temperature with respect to time was going to be proportional to the, uh, the temperature rather and its difference from the environment. Right? Sorry, that's a really badly placed minus sign. Okay? So you've got, that's a little better, you've got this same kind of relationship here. It's like, yeah, this is a little bit more complicated, but it's basically the same kind of idea. Okay. So what we have now is here, and you might want to put like sort of big colors over this, here are our time equations, our time equations. So if we know what time it is and how the thing is moving according to its time, these are the equations we would use and we would come up with the derivatives and the second derivatives that go with that in terms of time. Okay? But these guys over on the right hand side, like this one here and this one here, these are not time equations, they are displacement equations. Uh, displacement equations, plural. So there's not just the displacement equation, but there are equations in terms of the displacement. Uh, and this is for the second derivative in the context of simple harmonic motion. Now, once you think about this, it actually unlocks a whole different way of, like it's a whole different perspective on the same kind of situation. Why would it matter that we think about things in terms of where you are rather than thinking about them in terms of when you are? Hmm. So, as an example, oh, did I bring it with me? Oh, I didn't, but this will, this will do. Um, when we think about simple harmonic motion, right, we've already given you a few examples when you have a look at the questions. Um, one that I talked about was a tide, a boat moving up and down on a tide. It's doing this kind of thing, right? But many of the instances of simple harmonic motion don't have to do with time. They just have to do with position, right? So, for example, if I've got, um, let's just imagine my... Um, Let's, let's call my left hand one that's just stable and it's not going anywhere. And then I've got my right hand which is moving around on your left. And it can move in different spots with relation to this elastic band. Okay? Now think about what's going to happen. The further my right hand moves, because my left hand is just going to stay put. Okay? The further my right hand moves, what, like you can, you, you're not feeling this but you can see it, can't you? What is the elastic band doing to my right hand? It's pulling it back towards the center. Right? You see that? And the further I pull, the further I pull, it has nothing to do with time, right? Like I can stop, or I could take ages to go there, or I can do it really fast. It doesn't have anything to do with time. It has everything to do with where I am. The further I pull, the more of an acceleration, a change in my motion is being put. We call this a force, right? So the further I pull, the more I'm going in the opposite direction. And if I go, like say here, right? Now my right hand and my left hand are on the same spot. What kind of force is my right hand experiencing right now? It's not experiencing any force. There's no stretch. You can see it's just hanging there loosely, right? So in this case, with a displacement of zero, what acceleration is happening? Zero. So in fact, if you did this, right, um, the girls in the room who have hair ties can actually do this, take theirs off and uh, demonstrate it, right? You're, you're getting actually, if you have an ob object moving under an elastic sort of situation, it exhibits simple harmonic motion. If it's trying to move back and forth, right? Right at the origin, as it were, my left hand that wasn't moving, there's no force being exerted on it. But once you get to an extremity of motion, something is pushing you back. Okay? So we actually have a name for this. Again, you don't need to know the name, but it's kind of handy to have labels to talk about things. Um, both of these, here's my other one. Both of these are what we call a restoring force. A restoring 
force. The further you go in one direction, it sends you back in the other. Okay? Um, the extension 2 students, they actually have to look at stuff like air resistance or um, motion through a medium. That's the opposite of a restoring force. That's what we call a resisting force. It's like stopping you from going in whatever direction you're trying to go. This is making the motion go on and on and on and on. Okay? Now, yeah, question. So when we say force, um, that's I'm a bit being a bit sneaky here. We don't really need to worry about forces, but forces are things which change the kind of motion you're doing. That's another word for acceleration in our context, right? Which is why when we when we go back to like year ten physics, right? We write this, right? Force is really it's it's what happens when you think about acceleration in proportion to how heavy your object is. Okay, but um, I don't want to get too deep into that because it gets a bit confusing and we don't have to worry about all the nuances of this. So what we're going to do is, now that we can realize that we can think about things not just in terms of when you are, but where you are, we're just going to take a brief excursion, <coughs> excuse me, away from simple harmonic motion to all the different kinds of motion you can think about where things are in terms of the displacement. So I want to give you two examples of this really quickly. Uh, let's see if my projector hasn't gone to sleep yet. Oh, it has gone to sleep. Oh, no, there it is. Oh, it's because I can't see it. Yeah, sure. So, think about this for a second, right? How does gravity work? What kind of force is gravity exerting on an object? Well, it doesn't really depend on the time that you're at. It depends on where you are, right? The closer you are to said object, right, the more gravity it gets to exert on you. If you go really, really far away, it doesn't really have an impact on you, right? So this is a perfect example of where you want to think about velocity and acceleration in terms of where, in terms of displacement, rather than in terms of when. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me give you one other one, which um, was really interesting, which someone else clued me into. Here we go. Does anyone recognize these pictures? They're pretty old now. Um, I don't know who remembers, or who, how many people have watched the Fast and Furious movies? Fast and Furious, yeah, okay. So I've, I've watched a few of them, not all of them. There's just too many. I can't, can't keep up with all of them. But of course, most of you who watch the Fast and Furious movies know that, of course, right in the middle of, was it was between, I want to say between seven and eight, I can't remember, was when, very tragically, Paul Walker, like one of the main stars of it, passed away in, in a tragic accident, right? Now, in order to understand what happened, they had to look at all of this, okay? Now, what is this? Well, this is just a picture of, of what's happened after the fact, right? But because what you've got are all these marks on the road, you know you can work out, and this is exactly what they did, right? You can work out what the motion was doing, not in terms of time. Time's over. We don't have like footage of what actually happened. But we can read it in terms of where, right? We can say, oh, at this particular corner of the road, this is what his car must have been doing, and that's why it had a skid mark, right? Does that make sense? So sometimes situations can only be understood through the lens of displacement rather than through time. Okay, does that make sense?